It's the 23rd of November of 1936, and the most famous theoretical paper in the history of computing, Uncomputable Numbers by Alan Turing, has been published. Such paper gives a mathematical description of an imaginary computing device, a machine, designed to replicate the mathematical states of mind and symbol manipulating abilities of a human computer. Today, we will address only one of the many amazing results from that paper, and to be completely blunt, it's one of the most trivial things that appear in the whole writing, but in this case, trivial doesn't mean it's not interesting and mind-blowing. Now, in this video, there will be subjects we are not going to explain fully, so we'll be leaving in the description below a list of videos, posts, or books where you can consult such subjects calmly. But let's not get ahead of ourselves. First off, we have to understand, at least intuitively, what are computable numbers. And in order to do so, we begin by constructing our trusty number line. When we start to build it, the first numbers we place are the natural numbers, such as 1, 2, 3, and so on. We have as well the eternal debate of whether the zero is a natural knot, but for now it doesn't really affect the construction. This is the set of natural numbers. Afterwards comes the necessity of negative numbers, so we place them as well and the result are the whole numbers. We continue by adding fractions and now we have the rational numbers. But our number line is not complete since there are many numbers that cannot be expressed as fractions. Those are the roots of certain numbers, which cannot be reduced to rational. In general, this new set is called the real algebraic numbers, the ones that are a solution to an algebraic equation. Then again, we still have holes in our number line, which are the transcendental numbers, such as pi, e, logarithm of 2, etc. Normally, it is in this moment that by adding such numbers to our line, we say we have the famous real numbers. So far, this construction is the one we've been taught for basic math. We finally have a complete number line. So we call it a day, go to our homes and eat cookies watching our favorite streaming service, right? But in this moment, someone knocks at your door. It's Turing, and he says the construction you have actually missed something. We skipped over something very important when we defined the real numbers. Turns out that in his paper he proved the real numbers are actually split in two. Computable and non-computable numbers. To illustrate this, let's say we take number 3. Now, imagine you have to explain to someone how to get the number 3 without saying directly it's the number 3. You have to then give a recipe, an algorithm, to get it. A series of steps that lead to such number, and you may define it as the following. Take one and sum it three times. What you needed to define the 3 was the number 1 and addition. Such things can be as well explained to the individual, and therefore you can build the rest of natural numbers like that. The important part of this is that you can give an actual recipe for the whole numbers, and such recipe has a finite amount of steps. That is what we call being a computable number. When you can give a recipe, an algorithm, to describe completely such a number. And the reason it's called computable, it's because you can compute such a number, which is also the way we describe the process of giving the recipe to a computer and letting it make the calculations. Following the reasoning we just made for the number 3, we can do it again for every single whole number, and therefore we say whole numbers are computable. If we take the rational numbers and do a similar process, we can also say they are computable as well. 
But what about the other numbers when we gave the jump from rational to algebraic numbers? Well, since by definition are the ones that provide a solution to an algebraic equation, that implies that the recipe to get them is to solve the equation. Therefore, they are computable. The only ones left are the transcendental numbers. And you may think, well, those look very funny. They have an infinite amount of decimals without any pattern whatsoever. So they ought to be the infamous non-computable that you've been leading up to, right? Well, actually no, because take for example pi. You can describe a series of finite steps that describe the general behavior of it. Maybe we can't actually write the whole number, but we do know the recipe. And therefore, as we showcased before, such number is computable. And since we actually have a list of all the transcendental numbers we know so far, and we know the recipes for all of them, we can affirm that transcendentals are indeed computable. But then, which ones are the uncomputable ones? Well, let's pass this to an analogy. Imagine every computable number is a certain cookie, and we assign to every cookie its recipe. But then, there ought to be a lot of cookies that we don't know the recipe to. An infinite world of options in flavor, consistency, size, etc. That's what Turing proved formally that there are an infinite cookies that we don't know the recipe to, but they exist. And since we don't know the recipe, computers cannot generate them, and we cannot imagine such cookies. The moment that you assign the recipe to the cookie, the cookie becomes a computable. What this implies is that every single reel we've known so far is a computable. And as we're recording this, there's no way to truly see an uncomputable reel. Now, for any viewer who's at least a bit familiar with formal maths, you know that's not something uncommon. Proving existence is something that we are very content with. But not today. Today we'll go a bit further. What if I actually wanted to find such an uncomputable number? First, as we are very cautious about such quest. We want to see if it's even possible for us to find it, at least theoretically. This leads us to put on the glasses of probability and begin to do calculations. In order to simplify this task, let us say we want to find the probability of finding an uncomputable number between 0 and 1. Now, we assigned every computable we know between 0 and 1 to its recipe, and this recipe is unique to every computable. Therefore, we can imagine all the computables arranged in a list. There is a first, a second, a third, and so on. For those who are into more advanced math, what we are doing is using the fact that Turing proved computables are infinitely numerable, so we use the bijection they have with naturals. Now, let's take every computable and place it again on the number line. Now they are on a list. So the inspiration struck and we decide to cover each computable. Let's consider the first one. We take a certain interval, let's say of amplitude 0.1, and we can cover the space where the computable number lives. But as we notice, there's plenty of room left. The computable can be covered by a tighter interval. Let's say an interval of 0 0.00001. And we place it over there. If we were to magnify what is going on in that place, we would notice that there's actually plenty of room left, again. So we can take an even tighter interval and do it again, and again and again, and again. 
We can always make the room tighter and tighter and keep going as far as we want. This is what we call in maths to be arbitrarily small. And we represent that by saying the interval has a length of e that has to be greater than zero but as tiny as we want. Furthermore, since we have an arbitrarily small number, we can even take the half of that tiny number, which would be even tinier but still cover our computable subject. We repeat such process with every computable between 0 and 1, taking smaller and smaller intervals that can be, as well, arbitrarily small. Therefore, the total length of the computables would be roughly the sum of all of them, which is epsilon halves plus epsilon quarters plus... you get the gist by now. And such sum has been proven to be roughly epsilon. Now, some of these intervals may overlap for certain values of epsilon, but since we can make it as tiny as we want, it doesn't really affect. And since the probability of choosing a computable between 0 and 1 is the length of my interest area over the length of the interval, this results in being epsilon. What we have just proven is that the set of computable numbers has a measure of zero, which translates in the fact that the sum of all those lengths is so 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 tiny that the theoretical probability of ever choosing a computable between zero and one is practically zero. Now remember that probability varies from zero to one where zero means that it's practically impossible to get that event and one means it's practically certain. And since we know every real number is either computable or non-computable, then if the probability of choosing a computable was zero, choosing a non-computable must be one. Therefore, if we were to mix the contents of both bags and place them into the bots of real numbers, and later ask someone to take without looking an element of such bots, it's way more likely for the person to take a cookie instead of a recipe. But on the other hand, a few minutes ago we said that so far no one has been able to describe not even a single non-computable real number. This situation is also referred as the finding hay in a haystack problem. Think of the needles as the computable numbers and the hay as the non-computable. Theoretically, it should be almost certain that if we randomly pick an element from such myths, we would draw hay. But all we are getting are needles. This is the closest thing to a miracle. Something with a zero probability is actually happening. And not only one needle, but rather a numerable infinite amount of needles. There must be a catch, some of you may be thinking. How can this be? Hopefully, some of you realized by now where's the fishy part about our reasoning. And we encourage you to take a moment and write your answer in the comments before moving on with the video. Or, if you haven't figured it out yet, you can as well pause the video and ponder over it. The answer to such a tricky situation is that we are not randomly picking the numbers. What is actually going on is that someone gave us a metal detector and said, select the hay using this and only this. Obviously, what you're gonna get are nothing but needles. The metal detector represents the way we construct numbers, symbolizing the rigidness of the methodology. Since we only have this tool, we can't hope to get anything but computable numbers. It is absurd as repeating over and over again a recipe to make a cookie and expect the outcome to be a banana. Well, that analogy kind of weared off by now, but I hope it made sense. At this point, some of you might be wondering, 
Well, if you select all the needles, the rest is hay, and then that's done. Doesn't that actually solve the problem? Well, that's pretty much the state of things right now. We have the needles, and we know the hay is everything that is not a needle, but we cannot express the hay. Or at least, not for now, in the way we know how to express numbers. At this moment, another question pops into mind. I mean, we've been living so far without knowing how to express non-computable numbers, and so far nothing has gone wrong. So, do we actually have a reason to be looking for them to begin with? And the short answer to that question is no. Or at least, not yet. That's the true beauty of mathematics. Something that may seem totally useless today may be used in the future for another new branch of mathematics to make things easier to interpret and solve. So maybe what we just saw in this video is not useful now. And the probability of it being useful, let's say, tomorrow, it's infinitely small. Practically zero. But who knows? Maybe someone actually uses it, which would be itself a miracle.